What would Elton John sound like if Bernie Taupin wasn't in the fold? It touches on our last video where we talked about would there be an Elton John without Bernie Taupin? Would there be an Elton John without Caleb Quay? He used to give him free studio time and Bernie was there at the time. Snuck him in the studio and we'll have talks with Caleb Quay in the next few segments. But Stuart Epps gives an interesting take on what Elton John would sound like without Bernie Taupin. We talked to the engineer producer right after this. It was such a different stage for him. I mean, the thing is, I remember, uh, you know, all of the Elton John, I was an Elton John fanatic uh, at that point, And I was uh, 18 years old. And and I, I, I remember wanting to love the album just because I want, I was rooting for him because you get homers. We call them homers in North America. Some people do where that no matter what the artist puts out, no matter what right. it is, you're going to love it. Yeah. Nigel's your favorite drummer. D's your favorite bass player. Davey's your favorite guitarist because they're in that mm -hmm. band and they mean a lot to you. Not because they're technically the best, but they're certainly the best. That was something else that they had there. But that album, I remember first listen, I didn't like it. I thought it sounds different. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 I remember thinking it, it, it needs more bottom end. You know, I, I, I I'm very critical. And my, my other friends saying, are you kidding? It's like the best sounding Elton John record. And I remember mm -hmm. it being for years one of my favorite Elton John records. It just ended up being, uh, to me, it was refreshing. That album. It was stripped down in some ways. And uh, from your point of view, though, he had gone through this, and he was kind of like he had gone up here, and and no one knew where he was going. What what was the experience like? What was the Elton like that you worked with? Well, we had a good time. We had a lot of fun. He he was he was pretty mad um, during that album. Um, I mean, he was doing a few, uh, he was actually, if I'm remembering rightly, because I only did two at the mill, there's that one on Ice on Fire. Um, I think he was, do you know what, I can't remember what he was doing. I think, uh, I can't remember. But the thing is, the main difference was he wasn't writing with Bernie. They're, they're not Bernie songs. Yeah. So he was writing with uh, Gary Osborne, who's a lovely guy who wrote Blue Eyes and all that. Um, and... You see, I suppose that's the big difference, and I often talk about that, is that you can't imagine, well, you, you can imagine, and actually someone said, what do you think Elton would have been like without Bernie? Well, you could say um, single man, <laughs> because, um, you know, when Bernie sends Elton a lyric, that dictates the type of song uh, completely, really, and one way or another, that's the genius of that partnership, is that Bernie's, and it happened for obviously from the very first Elton John album, not the first Elton album, but the album called Elton John with your song. That's what changed the songs and the direction and all sorts was Bernie's lyrics. And they obviously set something off in Elton's mind to make him write in that way. And I guess, you see, he'll admit this himself. He doesn't wake up in the morning and write a song. He only writes a song to order. You know, when someone, when he's given a lyric or or the record company, which he's not with anymore, says we need an album, he doesn't write songs for fun. He writes songs as a job. He's a, he's a jobbing songwriter. So I think with, I don't even know what was behind singing. Well, it, it was Clive that was producing, so he didn't have Gus. He probably just thought, I want to make an album. Him and Gary had got together. He wanted to have some fun. I mean, there was also no one on that album telling him anything. Of Gus was pretty dynamic when Gus was producing. He would tell him if a song, if he thought a song was shit, if he thought it was great, if he thought it should be edited. You know, there was no one telling him anything. I remember there was a song for that album called Hello Campers, which um, which I don't think made it on there. But you know, it's the same. The sort of thing that he'd come up with because he, he is crackers he's made he's mad and uh, he's likely and he can write anything you know he can write anything i mean actually you, you're you're reminding me because one of the best things on that album was paul buckmaster who you know who who i've got stories about that and he's not with us anymore so he it doesn't really not that they're terrible stories but paul buckmaster was eccentric you know totally eccentric and um and, but there's some beautiful arrangements on that uh on that album and we did the strings at the mill and that was a special they were always special occasions you know to do strings but actually 
actually a little story there, which no one will know, so it's a scoop, is that Clive had been to see Paul months before the recording. And they'd been through every song, every song, and they'd, they'd said, this is what we want to do, this is what we want to do. And then it was months that Paul had to work on the album arrangements, right? So he gets, and, and so the, the mill is booked for, I don't know, a few days with an orchestra to do the arrangements all planned out. And, and it's, I can't believe I'm saying this now, but, but it is true because Paul turned up and he said, look, I've got a terrible thing to tell you. He said, the cat hit some ink and it went all over the arrangements. I haven't got any arrangements at all. He said they were completely destroyed destroyed he said so and clive saying obviously yeah that's funny that's a joke and he said well it's not i'm afraid i haven't got anything at all so <laughs> i'll have to write them again i'll have to write them all again and um and it wasn't a joke and i mean i think the cat thing was you know that was i don't think that was true to be honest but we'll the dog ate my homework it. the dog ate my homework yeah. we're gonna know now. anyway what i do know is that Unfortunately, he was a, he was into cocaine, and so a lot of cocaine had to be ordered. And him and Clive stayed up all that night writing the arrangements for the next day for the orchestra that then appeared, and then they'd be up that night writing, you know. So, uh, but the the but he was a a pure ge he's a genius, Paul Buckmaster. Um, oh yeah, you know his arrangements were just you know. So I'll I'll have to listen to that. I'll have to listen to that album again, but I, can't, I haven't listened to it for a long time. We'll have more from Stuart Epps coming up the next few days. Remember, he produced so many people, engineered a lot of people. He was the engineer on the Coda album with Jimmy Page. Worked with The Firm, Twisted Sister, Elton John, Paul Rogers, Jimmy Page, and a host of others. If you want to get produced by him, he is available. Go to his website, stuartepps.co.uk. Remember, subscribe to our channel. We always love it when you join our team, like our videos, spread the word, spread the videos on social media, and comment on them as well. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music.